God's word is his will and his will is his word. You want to know the will of God? Get the word of God. Internationally recognized for teaching and preaching the uncompromised Word of God, Bishop Clarence E. McClendon answers the prophetic and apostolic call upon his life by ministering the healing grace and miracle anointing of Jesus Christ around the world. By his preaching and teaching the uncompromised gospel of Jesus Christ, Bishop McClendon the teacher, the preacher, the apostle, and an anointed prophet sent to the nations being used by the power of the Holy Spirit has led to the healing and deliverance of millions around the world during his healing crusades and conferences. If you want to experience another level of worship, witness the healing power of Jesus, learn the uncompromised Word of God, confirmed by notable miracles, then we invite you to partake in the overwhelming power of the Holy Spirit by the moving of God's transforming grace. First of all, John chapter 1 and verse number 1, and it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. I'm going to jump down to verse number 14. Very familiar with most believers. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. I want you to pay very close attention to the structure. We beheld the Word's glory. We beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Going to jump down now to verse number 16. And of His fullness, speaking of the Word that was made flesh, and of his fullness, we have all received. Everybody say out loud, we have all received. And of his fullness, we have all received and grace for grace. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. I'm going to read Hebrews chapter 4 now very quickly. If you'll go there with me or if you don't have a Bible, if, I don't know if it's up on the screens behind me, but... You can trust me, I'm reading out of the book. Amen. Amen. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse number, oh goodness, let me, let me start at verse 11 because it, it says, Let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest, lest anyone fall according to the same example of disobedience. For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and joints and marrow and is a discerner of your thoughts and the intents of the heart. I'm going down now to verse 14. Seeing that we have a high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. The new King James says confession. The original King James Version says profession. The actual Greek word is homologeo or homologeo, however you pronounce it, meaning to say the same word as or to say the same thing as. Let us hold fast to our confession for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses but in all points was tempted as we are yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace. Everybody say find grace. grace. Let us come boldly to the throne of grace that we might obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. Now I want to examine for just a few minutes these two passages of scripture because I believe relative to the topic that I was given to minister on, these two passages of scripture both help us to see how this marvelous grace of God that has been given to us through the finished work of Jesus Christ is received, please hear me, both by us from God and also by us from one another. And make no mistake about it, when it comes to the grace of God, 
If we are going to live in the fullness of the liberty of this glorious and magnificent grace, this finished work of God through Jesus Christ, we must receive this grace, and we must not only receive this grace from God to us, but as a body of believers, we must receive this grace from one another. It is interesting to me that we major in extending grace to the unbeliever, but the moment we become believers, we stop extending grace to one another. So, so, so the question is, how is this grace received? The grace that we receive. Now let's make sure that we understand and qualify the terms. The grace of God, the, the Greek word is charis. It, it literally means the undeserved favor, the enabling power, the undeserved favor of God, the enabling power of God, and the divine influence of God upon our hearts. You can look it up in your Greek, your Greek, uh, Hebrew Greek lexicon, your Zodiac's Bible, your, your W.E. Vines. It generally comes down to these three things, these three connotations, that the grace, the charis of God is the undeserved favor of God. It is the enabling power of God, and it is the divine influence of God upon the heart. I, I like that last one because the divine influence of God on the heart kind of, it, it bends your heart in a certain direction. <laughs> it causes you to move in a certain way. And this grace is made available to us, of course, through the finished work of Jesus Christ. And whenever I refer to the gospel of the grace of God, I like to refer to it as the finished work because grace declares to us that the work that has to be done for us to be accepted by God has been completed through the person of Jesus Christ. That it is no longer a thing where I perform in order to get God's acceptance, but Jesus has fulfilled all the performance required, and through my believing on Him, I am accepted by God the Father. What a glorious message it is to proclaim. But then, one of the reasons I like to call grace, watch this, one of the reasons I like to call the grace of God undeserved favor instead of unmerited favor is for this very reason. There is something I have to do. I have to receive it. I have to believe it. Now, it's, it, it's still undeserved because when I believe it and when I receive it, the results of my action are so much greater than I should get that it's still undeserved. Have you ever done something and gotten so much more for what you did than what you know you deserve that you almost feel guilty? That's what grace will do. But instead of producing guilt in us, it produces an overwhelming love and an overwhelming appreciation to the God who loved us so much that he allows us to approach him because of what Jesus has done. So how is this grace received? I read these two passages of scripture because they, they both, uh, both of them have a common thread that, uh, ex that is expressed in the, that expresses to us or shares with us the way this grace is received. And to me at least, in both passages, that common thread is rather clear and rather consistent. And by God's grace tonight, I pray that I'll be able to share it with you. The first thing that we must identify, the, the grace that I receive, how do I receive this grace? Well, first of all, uh, we must identify the conduit by which the grace of God is imparted to us. And that's why I began in John chapter one and verse one, because it says to us, in the beginning was the word. And the word was with God and the word was God. And then in the 14th verse, it goes on to say, and the word was made flesh, and we beheld his glory. Now, I want you to get the, 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 the construct of the sentence. The word was made flesh, and we beheld the word's glory. We beheld the word's glory, and the word's glory, when we beheld it, was full of grace and truth. Now, we've got to qualify a couple of turns because in English, that's a little opaque. We beheld the word's glory. What is the glory of God? 
What is it actually? I know the Hebrew words kabod. I know the Greek words doxa. I know the, uh, the, the interpretation to be heavily weighted down with good. I get it all. But practically, look at your neighbor and say practically. Practically. What is glory practically? You know, the interesting thing about the Bible that I love is that if you read enough of it, it interprets itself. <laughs> I'm going to say that again. If you read it enough, it interprets itself. I had a, a, a seminary professor, a good Presbyterian seminary professor. His name was Dr. William Bodimer. He was a Princeton theologian. And he would say, the interesting thing about the Bible is it explains a lot about the commentaries. You didn't get it. You didn't, you didn't get it. You didn't, you didn't get it. If you read the Bible, it'll, it'll explain the commentaries to you. I thought that was funny when I was in school. Anyway, so, so, so the interesting thing about the Word of God is if you read enough of it, it'll interpret itself. One of the greatest definitions, practical definitions, working definitions of the glory of God I've found anywhere is in Exodus chapter 33. In Exodus chapter 33, as a matter of fact, I'm going to read it to you because I don't want you to take my word for it. Go to Exodus chapter 33 real quickly, uh, and I want you to see this in your own Bible if you have one, and if you don't have one, uh, look on with somebody else, because I want you to see this. It's a very interesting passage of Scripture. This is when God and Moses are talking, and, and, and I love this exchange. I, I don't know about you, I, I see comedy in the Bible. Uh, God is funny. Uh, he, he really is. And, and, and there's this exchange in Exodus 30. 30, you know, 31, 32, 33, and you know, uh, the children of Israel, they've left Egypt. Moses has gone up into the mountain to get the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments. Uh, the children of Israel have built a golden calf, and, and Moses is in the presence of God. The children of Israel are down there sinning around the calf, and there's this exchange. If you read it very carefully, it'll make you laugh. It's like Exodus 31, 32, going up to 33, and, and God tells Moses, listen, get down from here, because the people you brought out of Israel are sinning. And Moses looks back and God says, wait, wait, these aren't the people I brought out of Israel. These are the people you brought them out of Israel. And there's this exchange between God and Moses where God is calling the people Moses and Moses is calling the people gods and nobody wants to own these people. <laughs> and, and this is where God tells Moses, he says, listen, take the children on into the, the promised land. I'm not going with you. I'm going to send an angel for you. Keep me in the way. Bring him to the place. Prayer. But I'm not going with you, he says, because you're a stiff-necked people. And Moses pleads with God there, and, and he says, you know, if you're not going, I'm not going. And, 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 and God says, oh, okay, all right, because you said this, I'm going to go with you. And then Moses, because he's got God, you know, by, by, the, by the leg, he said, okay, since you said yes to that, he said, I beseech you, show me your glory. And God responds to Moses. Now watch this. Verse 18 of Exodus 33, he said, please show me your glory. Verse 19 is God's response. Then he said, I will make all my goodness pass before you, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before you. I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. But he said, you cannot see my face, for no man shall see me and live. That tells me something about where the glory of God is located. It's in the face of God. And the Bible declares in this new covenant, we have beheld the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Stay with me. And the Lord said, uh, uh, he, but he said, you cannot see my face for no man can see me and live. And the Lord said, here is a place by me and you shall stand on the rock and it shall be while my glory passes by. Oh, wait. I want you to get First God says, you can't see my face. Moses, show me your glory. God says, you can't see my face, but here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to put you in a place next to me. And if I had the time, I would show you that that place is you and I seated in Christ. But I don't have time to go there. I can, I can, but, 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 but watch this. I'm going I'm to put you in a place by me. I'm going to cover you with my hand. Watch this. He said, and I'm going to cause all my goodness to pass before you. And I'm going to proclaim the name of the Lord before you. How many of you know that God has several names? Actually, and I don't want to mess anybody up, God is not a name. It's actually an office. It's a function. You say, Bishop McClendon, I've never heard anything like that. If you remember, in Exodus chapter 6, God tells 
Moses, he says, I made myself known to Abraham as El Shaddai, God Almighty, but by my name, I was not known to them. His name is not God. His name is Yad Hevavhe, the tetragrammaton. It is Yahweh. It is Jehovah. And then there are covenant names of God. You know the names. Jehovah Sidkenu, Jehovah Shalom, Jehovah Makedesh, the Lord our sanctifier, Jehovah Rapha, the Lord our physician healer. Are you here? I said, are you here? So, so watch this. So watch this. So God says, I'm a, he, he, Moses, show me your glory. God said, I can't wait to see my face, but here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to let all my goodness pass before you, and I'm going to proclaim the name of the Lord before you. And then he says, and it shall be as my glory passes by. So God just gave us insight into what his glory is. His glory is in part when his goodness materializes in connection with his name. I'm going to say that again. The glory of God in part is when his goodness materializes connected to his name. One of his names is Jehovah Sitkanu, the Lord our righteousness. So when his goodness materializes in righteousness, glory has just shown up. One of his names is Jehovah Yireh or Jehovah Jireh, the Lord our provider. So when God provides for you, guess what just happened? Glory materialized. Are you still here? His name is Jehovah Rapha, the Lord our physician healer. So when someone who is sick recovers from sickness and is made well, guess what just happened? Glory. Glory showed up. Isn't it interesting? Jesus said this at the end of his ministry before he left. He said, I have manifested your name to them. I showed them what shalom is like. I showed them what Rafa is like. I showed them what Sitkanu is like. I showed them what Jehovah uh, 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 Rohi, the Lord, our shepherd. I showed them what it's like. Stay with me. We beheld the Word's glory. Here's what we beheld in Jesus. We beheld the Word materialize. We, 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 we beheld the mind of God materialize. We, we saw God's goodness show up. How did it happen? By the word. And watch it. He says, and when the goodness of God materialized through his word, watch this, we beheld this materialization of God's goodness and we beheld it, watch this, full of grace and truth so watch this the way the grace of God is received is through the Word of God you cannot receive God's grace and be without knowledge of his word for his word is how his grace is revealed now watch this in the in the passage in Hebrews it's very interesting to me, and I'm one of those Bible readers that when I read the Bible, I ask questions. I, 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 I inquire of the Lord and I ask questions. Go back to the passage in Hebrews I read real quickly, and I'm, I'm going to hurry with this because I know my time is leaving us. In Hebrews chapter 4, please stay with me here. In Hebrews chapter 4 and verse number 11, the writer of Hebrews is talking to us about entering into God's rest. He has given us the example of how the children of Israel had an opportunity to enter into that rest. But the Bible says the word that they heard did not profit them because it wasn't mixed with faith in those that heard it. Are you still here? And then it goes on to say, let us fear, not be afraid, but let us be reverent. Let us pay attention so that we don't miss entering into the rest. Now look at verse 11. Let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest, lest anyone fall according to the same example of disobedience. Look at verse 12. For the word of God is living in power. I want you to notice how the Hebrew writer connects entering into the rest that is ours in the grace of God to the word of God. In one point, at one point he's talking about rest and he shifts immediately to the word. Why? Because the word is how the rest is entered. 
You cannot enter the rest that is yours in the grace of God if you do not have knowledge of the word of God. So the word of God is the conduit. It's the means by which the grace of God is received. And then secondly, we must understand that the word of God is at least twice referred to in the book of Acts as the word of his grace. Wait a minute. I, I, I got to go here. I got to do this line up online, preach up on preach. It's referred to as the word of his grace. Go to Acts 14, quick. Go to Acts 14. I'd like you to put your eyes on it if you can. In Acts 14 and verse number three, it says, therefore, that, this is talking about Paul, therefore he stayed there a long time speaking boldly in the Lord who was bearing witness to the word of his grace. Everybody say the word of his grace. Say it again, the word of his grace. Say it again, the word of his grace. The Lord was bearing witness to the word of his grace, granting signs and wonders to be done by their hands. Very quickly, go to Acts chapter 20. I just want you to see this in your Bible because I'm going to build on this in a very significant way, I believe, that will help all of our lives. Look at Acts chapter 20 and verse number 32. Are you guys here or have you left me? Look at your neighbor and say, he'll stop yelling at you in about 12 minutes, I promise. Watch this. Verse 32. So now, therefore, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among those who are sanctified. Everybody say an inheritance. Isn't it interesting? The Bible refers to what you and I have received through Jesus Christ as an inheritance. And the thing about an inheritance is an inheritance is not something you work for. An inheritance is something that has already been worked for. And you received your inheritance because of your knowledge of the will. Did you get what I just said? You receive your inheritance as a product of your knowledge of the will. God's word is his will and his will is his word. You want to know the will of God? Get the word of God. Are you still with me? So watch this now. Touch your neighbor and say, we're going just a little bit deeper now. Just a little bit deeper. Watch this. So it's called, the word of God is called the word of his grace. Now again, what is grace? It is undeserved favor. It is enabling power. It is divine influence. So the word of God is the word of his undeserved favor. Every time you read the word of God, every time you receive the promises of God, you are hearing God say something about you that you don't deserve. But it's yours because of the finished work of Jesus. I'm going to say that again. Every time you read the word of God, every time the word of God says something about you, the word of God is called the word of his grace. It is the word of his undeserved favor about you. Now watch this. For that word to work in my life, I have to receive it. For that word to work in your life, you have to receive it. And then you have to believe it. Go to James chapter 1 real quickly. And I'll be done here in a few minutes. James chapter 1. How much time do I have left? Somebody stand up. You know, listen. Uh, charismatic Pentecostal preachers, we never get done. We just have to quit. <laughs> we, we never finish anything. We just leave. Okay, so, so, so I don't know how much time I have. Somebody, am I close to time? Am I out of time? Am I... Uh, Oh, okay, okay, let me, let me just, okay, I won't be very much longer, I promise you, but I want to get this to you. Everybody say the word of his grace. Say it again, the word of his grace. Say it again, the word of his grace. Look at your neighbor and say the word of God is his word concerning the undeserved favor he has given to you in Christ Jesus. See, that's why he calls you righteous already. And that's why he calls you holy already. And that's why he calls you his son and his daughter already. Not because you've earned it, but because the word is the word of his undeserved favor. 
that we have received through Jesus Christ. Now here's what I have to do. I have to receive that word and then I have to believe that word. Here's a decision I made. I have made a decision that if my opinion of me is contradictory to God's opinion of me, I don't trust me. <laughs> Did you hear what I just said? Not because I've earned it, but because he said it about me. So watch this. Watch this. Look at James chapter 1 and verse number 23. Oh, this is good. I hope it's as good coming out as it is coming up. James chapter 1, verse number 22. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. And I want you to get what God is saying to us here. He is telling us that when we look into the word of God, we are looking into the divine mirror. You are looking into how God, by His grace, sees you and is showing yourself to you. Every single week, tens of thousands of people around the globe connect with this ministry, connect with this prophetic word through the PEC. You say, Bishop McClendon, what? is a PEC member. That's a part of our prophetic e-community. And those who join us on Facebook Live, on Twitter, on Periscope, and receive the Word of God. If you are not yet a PEC member, you're not a PEC partner, you're not yet a part of the prophetic e-community, I want you to go to bishopmcclendon.com and just sign up. It doesn't cost you anything but the value, I promise you, is going to be enormous. Once you become a PEC partner with us, that enables me to begin to share with you faith-building letters, to share with you the prophetic insights, the prophetic words that God is giving me. And that is so important for your life, especially as things begin to escalate in this 2018, the year of the shift, you're going to need the Word of God. I need it every single day of my life, and uh, I'm grateful to the Lord that He's provided us this avenue to communicate with you. So go to bishopmcclendon.com. Matter of fact, you can go right now and connect. It's very simple. Again, it doesn't cost you anything, but you will be getting information. You'll be getting letters, prophetic words. You'll be getting things that the Spirit of God is giving me to edify your life. He says, no matter how you feel, let the weak say I am strong. Let the poor say I am rich. Let the sick say I am well. Why? It's not because I feel it. It's because my high priest takes my confession, goes to the Father and says, Father, the doctor said that Jimmy has cancer, but Jimmy said, He's healed.